Welcome to Anecdotal Anatomy, the podcast that curiously explores the stories the body holds and tells through conversations, stories, and practices. Our mission is to connect the individual to the collective through our stories, so we may better understand our interdependence and ultimately live a more peaceful coexistence. Is that too much to ask for? Each episode builds from the last and contains kernels of every conversation we've had to date. We cover sciencey things like fascia, anatomy, the nervous system, and other body-based sciences. We also have a pretty high tolerance for the woo factor, which, let's face it, is also energy and should not be discarded as if it has no value. We are nature-loving, yoga and meditation teaching podcasters that could, aiming to make the world just a little better than we found it. Our motto is, leave no trash trace, we're only visiting, but leave your heart print with every step. Welcome listeners. We are so happy that you are here, honestly yes. and truly to uh, continue this journey of Yoga Eat with us as we dive into personal observances, uh, the Niyamas, uh, to complement our last episode, which was the Yamas. Now we get into personal observances. And, you know, Sherry, I, I, I started to tell you and you're like, we need to record because yes. things are going to come. So the first one, and here we go. Saucha, yes? Uh, did I, yes. Did I say it right? Yes, boom, Saucha. Which is when I started reading about Salsha, which is purity, cleanliness, and clearness. I just started thinking about how delicious that was when I was thinking about purity and cleanliness. The first thing that came into my mind was, whoa, purity and cleanliness. I can have such a delicious diet. And I went right to food for some reason of maybe because I have a practice of using every bit of food that's in my house. And so when I go to the CSA, the Community Supported Agriculture, where I purchase my organic foods that are locally grown. So this is really important to me that they're locally grown because it lets our environment be more pure and clean without having to ship my food from California to Pennsylvania. So there's a little bit of cleanliness right in the right in where I receive the food. But it has over the years of buying my food locally has turned into a practice of purity and cleanliness because the very first thing I do when I bring it in is wash it all before wow. it goes into my refrigerator. You know, it's not pre-washed because it's, well, many, much of it is, but still it's from a farm. So you know, that could be dirt and I want to keep my refrigerator <laughs> clean. So I wash it all up. I also have an aversion to throwing any of it away. And so I clear all the vegetables of the green parts that maybe I, I'm not going to eat. So mm -hmm. I do saute the tops of the greens of many of the vegetables that are still on when you get them from a farm, which I absolutely love. But if there's too much for me to eat, I put them all in my crock pot and simmer them for a day. And then that becomes the broth to make my rices and so many other things that I, or a future soup. So yeah, before it leaves, it's been cleaned and cleaned of any of the dirt from the farm, but also cleaned of all of the amazing nutrients that are housed in those greens that I can eat later. So I went right to diet and lifestyle. And that's the beauty of this, this is that it extends to everything. It's purity of our body, which includes our diet, maybe a different exercise program, things that are sort of, you know, directed toward wellness, um, our speech, you know, what are we taking in and what are we putting out? I was reading in, I've got this resource, the Yamas and then the Yamas by Deborah Adil, fabulous book. I'm going to put it in the show notes. I think I have before. Oh, she said, she was studying with her guru, who you can read the book to find his name. I'm, I'm not there right now. And he had given her a spiritual name. And the spiritual name had connotations of purity. And she didn't understand at the time that she was actually talking about this niyama. But she said, how do her, she, she, had a, she could ask him a question. And her question was, 
how do I live fully into this name that you've given me? And he started laughing and his laughter, you know, she's like, what? He says, your poop should smell like nectar and your pee should smell like nectar. And so she was thinking about it and she was like, oh, so the things that I take in should be pure so that when they leave me, they're also pure, you know, that, and I thought that was really interesting. It also made me think of, and sometimes we take in things that are impure and we purify it in our digestion, you know, whether it's the actual act of digestion, allowing, creating the new substance that is waste that leaves or the emotional digestion that takes a discursive thought and turns it around. It comes into your mind or it comes into your ears. And all of a sudden there's a practice there. There's a meditation or there's an affirmation or there's an experience that purifies that discursive thought. And you go, whoa, wait a minute. That's not right. I'm fucking awesome or whatever it is. And so that can purify this kind of, was this the one, there was a couple of these made me think of Manipura. I'm looking around now. I am sitting within an incredible mess. I've got paper scattered. I've got an old coffee cup here that has, you know, I got to rinse that. That's a little embarrassing, but hello, this is who you're talking to right now. And if you're just listening, I just held up a coffee cup that has old coffee that is, you know, on the bottom of it. So I'm looking around and I'm seeing this is a reflection of my life right now. And it absolutely is. And we're going to get there too. All of these niyamas, like the koshas, like the chakras, like all of these subtler systems are difficult to identify exactly and distinctly from the others. There's going to be those little hints and energies that, that flow in and out. And so I'm sitting here in this mess talking about purity and cleanliness, and it makes me giggle because this is the story of my fucking life. This is the dichotomies that, that are constantly present. I'm always trying to tell my kids that being human is complicated and that we are filled with contradictions, but the contradictions don't have to translate to hypocrisy. They can be the things we're working on and seeing things in a sense of wholeness. So, you know, dichotomy, yin, yang, stirasuka, we throw these words around, but one cannot be without the other. The light cannot be without the darkness. And I know that that just sounds so like, <laughs> yes, cliche at this point, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but just to kind of fill in those gaps of, you know, the experience of what all these things mean and how we live them and how we don't always live them at the highest level. But it, it's okay because everything is impermanent and we get to work on it. We get to see it. Everything is an ebb and a flow and an expansion and contraction. There's pulsation in everything we do. And so not to get stuck in when you're sitting in a fucking mess, the cesspool of life, because it's going to be a beautiful garden tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, beautiful garden. I love that. It's a, such a beautiful transformation. She says, as her own garden has been neglected all summer. So like, forget about it. This is been a tough time. Uh, you know, I like that it, in reference to what you were saying, that the niyamas are called personal observances, right? So yes, there are all those things that we're working on, but I also like that it's framed in a way that we get to observe self and notice through these lenses. It's not saying personal perfections or personal must-tos, it's personal observances to notice how we fall in any given moment or different times in our life to these principles and these observances. When are they in balance? When are they out of balance? And how do they fit in at different times? Uh, I used to have a big mess around me all the time. I remember my desk in my office when I worked in dentistry. It had piles everywhere. And somebody came up who was temping at one point. She's like, you know, I'm going to hang out here and clean up your desk for you. And I was like, you cannot touch my desk. Please. Oh, oh my Boy, God. Yeah, please do not touch. I know where everything oh, so with is. With a small G. With a small G. Oh, my yeah, God. Was, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and I was like, I know where everything is. It might look messy to every observer that comes in, but ask me for something the doctor needs, and I can walk to the pile, pick it up, and take it out. Mm -hmm. So... Is that cleanliness? I don't know. But I knew I, I was a disorganized, organized mess. So maybe that comes into Svadhyaya, that self-study as we get, you know, I, but is it cleanliness? Probably. I mean, if you're organized, I, I see that kind of thing very differently because I was always a slob. I'm mm. still a slob and it takes a lot of effort for me to 
to be able to, and once I get organized, I'm disorganized and I don't, it's hard for me. And my sister, who I shared a room with, she was neat as a pin and always had to walk through my chaotic mess to get to her beautiful space. And I think I may have told this story in season one, but my mother used to tell a story that uh, when I was a teenager, she came to my room and she opened the door and she saw me there with piles of clothes and crap on the floor. The music was blaring and I was dancing my heart out. And as soon as I realized she was there, I turned around and according to her, I said, I just love being a teenager. And to that, she exercised wisdom in that moment. Normally she'd been like, Sherry, clean your room or whatever. She smiled, she closed the door and she walked away. And, <laughs> you know, and that's interesting because that actually brings up the presencing that in the book, Deborah Deal's book, she has this story about Saucha. And I think that this kind of meets it in a, its own way. Uh, I'm going to uh, read it to you because I don't want to mess it up, but this is from her section on purity. Uh, she's a, a story about a young female patient lying in bed. Standing beside her is her surgeon who has just removed a tumor from the young woman's face. Her husband, also in the room, stands at a distance. The patient is looking at herself in a handheld mirror for the first time after the surgery. Staring at the obvious downward turned corner of one side of her mouth, she asks the surgeon if she will always look lopsided. The surgeon replies a solemn yes, noting that he had to cut a nerve to get the tumor out. In that crucial moment where the silence betrays a young woman doubting her phys future physical appeal, the husband acts. He walks over to his wife and tells her that he thinks she looks kind of cute with one side of her mouth turned down. Then he looks at her tenderly, shapes his mouth like hers, matching lips to lips and kisses her. Oh, no. That just makes me want to cry because this was, she says, the jewel of Satcha or purity carries a twofold meaning. First, Satcha invites us to purify our bodies, our thoughts, and our words. As we purify ourselves physically and mentally, we become less cluttered and heavy. Purification brings about a brightness and clarity to our essence. Second, this guideline has a relational quality. No one in the above story could have known ahead of time what the outcome of the surgery would be. Yet in that moment when the wife doubted her own appeal, the husband was able to be with her purely and in that purity support her sense of self and the beauty of their relationship. And while, you know, certainly not equating the weight of these two experiences, what my mother did in that moment when she met the chaos of my current reality is that rather than butt up against it, she was with me purely and allowed me to just simply be rather than impose her own you know, sense of purity on that. So I just thought that was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that story. It gave me chills. Right? Oh. Yeah. So you were talking about which of the chakras. When I was reading, purity and saucha was, was connected to Vishuddha, the throat chakra. So releasing the limiting beliefs and being able to speak with purity and cleanliness, but also our own conversation with ourselves. So and the releasing of these limiting beliefs that are stopping us. And that reminded me of our, our, work, our workshop that we went to with Stacy last weekend, where we were able to step into our future self, another exercise that she had. And in order for me to feel like I could step into the places that I want to go, the things I want to create, that future self with a pure thought that, hey, yeah, you can really do this, was I need the practice of releasing limiting beliefs that maybe there's a fear of success or that I'm not really ready to do the things that I want to do, or I'm not smart enough to create the programs that we're working on or whatever that limiting belief is that doesn't let me step fully into my pure gifts and skills to be able to share them in service. Beautiful. So, oh, so purity, yeah. you know, and, and it sounds so superficial, but for me, the beginning of generating the habit of cleanliness in the physical space starts with making my bed in the morning. If I mm -hmm. just make my bed, then I feel like I've done something to, to create that space, to deliberately organize something. And then that sort of turned into my daily sadhana, this, you know, daily discipline, but that's going to come a little bit later. Hey. Purity. How does it show up? How do you do your dishes? One and 
you know, not only. I thought you were going to say one at a time. One at a time. (laughs) That's a good answer, though. I I, I wish it had come to me. (laughs) So I also think that, you know, in in answering the question of the dishes before we move on to uh, Santosha is I don't think that the purity means that I have to wash my dishes immediately after I use them. Sometimes they sit in the sink for a bit, and then I'll get around to that being the next chore that needs to get done. But also purity of attitude. I can remember being younger, like, oh, why is it my job to empty the dishwasher or whatever it was? There was always the, oh, the attitude about it. So maybe the purity isn't necessarily in the timing that we get things done. But how do we approach them? Can we put on some music and dance while we're while we're doing those chores that, you know, maybe aren't the most fun thing that we want to do that day? And maybe we really have to, sometimes I really have to carve out the time. So there's then there's also that. the joyful effort, which is not part of this system, yeah. but it is part of the larger system, yoga system. But that joyful effort piece you know, to be able to enjoy that. But also it's different at different times in your life. I have three kids and when they don't do the dishes in a timely way, to me, that's kind of a little bit of a fuck you. You know, it's, there's very few things that we ask. This is one of those things. So there's that discipline piece. Again, not being able to extricate this purity thing purely and as its own pure entity, but as it sort of is melded with all of these other energetic parts of the system that yes, for us, the time is not as important because we're approaching it, we're adults, we're kind of, you know, we know what needs to be done and we'll do it as we need to do it. And it's our choice. But for the kids, this is, these are lessons of habituating, you know, good habits, habituating good habits. Can I mm. use that? Or the you same? could put them together. We're going to give I'm you a pass on it. that, gonna, right? Let's I'm do that it. Pass today. I'm taking yeah. it today. Uh, yes. But, you know, so I find myself reacting differently when it's around my kids than say even my husband or myself and I definitely give myself a pass a lot, but I also know where that has, I have bumped up against that in my life a lot and not always the most positive ways. And so as a parent, I want, you know, to set my kids up to succeed and I want them to, and success is different, you know, for everyone. And it's not a traditional line of success, but success in their lives where they can be on their own and do their own stuff and be responsible for, you know, their space in a, in a such a way. I guess clearing this all up, <laughs> clearing it up as a clearness. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I picked up over the years, as far as my space goes, because I've downsized a lot significantly over the years, I kept getting into smaller places to live, smaller places to live. So, you know, if you're living in a smaller place, you have no option but to downsize and move some things along, re gift them. Uh, you know, donate them, whatever it is that needs to get done to pass them along for others to use. But I was shopping with my mom one day and I had something I wanted to buy. And she just paused for a minute because I really liked this thing and it was a want. And so it was definitely a want. And she stopped and she was like, so, you know, when you're deciding if you should invest in the thing, is it a want? Or is it a need? And it wasn't that it had to be a need to purchase it. It was more just the awareness. Like, how does this fit in? Is it something that you absolutely need to have to do whatever you do with your life? Or is this a want? I just really like it and I want to have it. So asking that question became an important part of my purchases. And the other thing was, if you're buying something for your house, where are you going to put it? And that was so much harder because sometimes I see a piece of art or just something that really I loved. And she'd say, so where are you going to put it? And I would stop and I was like, I don't have a blank wall. I don't have, like, I had no place to put it. Right. So, so that question yeah. was for the want and the, for the need and the desire was one preferential over nope. the other? Nope. It was just so that there was a pause to have an awareness because Sometimes everything that I ever wanted fit fit in with a need. Oh, I need to get this. I mm-hmm. need to buy this. I need this thing. Right. But it wasn't really a need. It was a want. So it wasn't that there was a preferential. It wasn't even that one was better than the other. It was just a pause for awareness so that the decision mm-hmm. had some layers to it to yeah. be able to decide, should I or should I not invest in this object? My mom had a whole different system, but had nothing to do with need or desire had everything to do with ones, twos, and threes. 
She would say, if you see something and it's a three, you know you don't like it. It's it's a clear choice. The twos are hard because you kind of like it. Like you're not exactly sure, but it could be the best thing ever. The number ones, there's no question about it. You love it, love it, love it. And so only get the ones, she said, mm. because the twos you'll never wear or look at again. You know, you're you're trying to rationalize that in. The number ones are clear. You only get the ones. Mm. But whether See? you needed it or wanted it, it didn't matter. It had to be a number one. Our wise crones passed all kinds of great things right? down to us. Yes. And that fits huh. into so many other things, too. You know, you were talking about getting rid of things as living as you downsized. And it made me think of a parigraha, the last one of the yamas, which is the non-hoarding, the, you know, non-essentials and put things where they're needed. And so uh, it made sense to me as things are in logical progression that we move from non-hoarding into cleanliness and purity. That's the first one of the niyamas. So if you look at the flow of these yamas and niyamas, there is a logic to them. There is a progression to the practices. And so while we do add in all different limbs and we can create our own menu of options, that there is, there is wisdom to the way that this was created. Yeah, and, and going in order, it seems that the next niyama fits right in with that, which is Santosha. So, but oh. before we get to Santosha, I want to give a practice because Deborah Adil in her book, which I'm holding up now and I will put it in the show notes, at the end of each section, and she may have had it also for the yamas, but I, I wasn't paying attention at that time, but she's got practices, four weeks of practice at the end of each section. I am not going to read all four of the practices, but since we like to give practical things for you to do to embody these concepts that can get really out there, I'm going to read one from each section. And I highly encourage, if this is a rabbit hole you're interested in going down, yes, the internet is great, but this book, there's nothing more satisfying than putting little tabs and opening a book over and over and over again where the spine is getting vulnerable and, you know, you're just, and we can talk about vulnerable spines in different <laughs> scenarios and <laughs> how that comes up, but it's, there's something really treasured about a physical book that you can over and over again, mark up and, and look in. I don't have to tell you that. So I'll read one of the exercises for Saucha. So for just week one, I'll do all the week ones. This week, notice where your body is sluggish. Begin to purify yourself through diet and exercise and the space around you if that is making you sluggish. Notice how the sluggishness becomes lighter as you purify. Notice the difference between external process of cleansing and the internal process of purifying. Interesting distinction, and I love it. I hadn't gotten there yet. So there are three other exercises. She says, for this month, ponder the words of Krishnamurti and live purely with each moment as it is. With each moment as it is. Santosha, contentment. Be in the flow. Yeah, we just get to keep moving from one concept, one practice uh, to the next. And this contentment and um, feeling centered and at peace. Sometimes for me, I have to say it's a it's a little fleeting. I like to I like to work toward being content, but sometimes I just maybe it's that I get bored easy, and instead of sitting with boredom, I sit and I was like, oh, I'm just not content, and I mix my emotions from one to another. But to be content, to be happy with what I have, to feel that I have enough and live from a place of abundance rather than that place of lack. You know, there is that old cliche, the grass is always greener on the other side, but it's really not. It's just as green on my side as it is any other place. So contentment is a practice that captures my attention to notice and become aware of those times that I just feel like I don't know. I have to do something more, fix something more. I'm always behind. I'm not getting things done. Ugh, all of those brain, brain, I'll call them brain farts. So, you know, <laughs> or the drunk monkeys jumping around in there saying, yeah. you know, get out, do something. <laughs> the, the, great, the Grateful Dead has a great lyric. And I may even have sung it on this show before. Oh, the sing, grass, please sing. The grass ain't greener. The wine ain't sweeter. Either side <laughs> of the hill. And you know, this is why I don't sing all the time. Don't have the gift. But this is one of the things of all of these yamas and niyamas that I feel really well connected to. I have sense of contentment is, I think, one of my, my superpowers. 
I, I, cause I see a lot of, I, I have heard people talk a lot of discontentment and I see it out there and I know you can't see it unless you have it in you. So there's a little bit of a contradiction. So I'm sure there's some discontent in there. I'm sure there's, but I, I don't resonate high with the opposite of, of contentment. In fact, my mother used to say, again, mom, hi, mom, you must be coming in a lot. I remember her coming in to visit me at NYU and I had a paper due the next day. And I said, ah, I'm not going to stress out about it. And she said, Sherry, stress out a little bit. You know, most people suffer from too much stress. You suffer from not enough. <laughs> and you know, we've talked about stress not always being bad and how, you know, I always kind of very suka heavy, very kind of, you know, easy with the boundaries and I give myself a pass a lot. You know, I just, I don't, I have a certain urgency of this life, but I have I've always come from a place of abundance. And so I, I love this. I, I will recognize when I fall out of that. And certainly it's not 100% across the board. Like you said, it's not a perfection thing. But I think my dominant inclination is contentment. And I'm good with boredom. <laughs> good. Uh, I like to find a balance in the midst of challenges. I think that's what contentment is. And in challenging times, I'm working on it. I'm really working on being able to look at challenges that are put in front of me and say, you know, the universe going back to that higher power, whatever we're going to label it as God, Mother Gaia, the earth, nature. But to know that some of these challenges are just opportunities and learning and things that are taking me from place to place. And you know, the funny thing about this, uh, when I have to chuckle at myself, is that if I look back over my life and I'm in reflection of the past, I can clearly see times that were extremely challenging that led to really great opportunities and blessings. But when I'm in the midst of those challenges, I cannot always adopt that same thought that, hey, guess what? This challenge, when you look back on it in five or 10 years, you might see it the same way. It's a lot more difficult to stay rooted in the place of contentment. I totally agree. I mean, I think there's no question about that. I think also, as far as seeing things as they are, you can be sad and you can feel the emotional, or I'll speak for me, I went, even if I'm feeling an emotion that I wouldn't necessarily put into a category of, you know, joy or wonderful or positive or any of that, if I'm feeling frustrated or I'm feeling challenged by something, I can still meet it as it is and not need to be anywhere other than where I am. And I think that is content. So I can still feel it, but I'm willing to be there with it. And so there's something you're saying, Tosha invites us into contentment by taking refuge in a calm center, opening our hearts in gratitude for what we do have and practicing the paradox of not seeking. So while in that situation, not seeking another experience, I think this, this niyama speaks directly to non-attachment and in a way that, you know, it could be, it goes back to that old thing is, you know, everything happens for a reason. Well, would you tell someone that when they first get a cancer diagnosis? Probably not. Like that would not be the time to say that. That person may have practices in place that allow them to meet that very challenging moment in a different way than someone else who is new to working with their energies and their emotions. You know, that's, that's a different story. But I think, you know, when you have the, the gift of perspective as time goes by, it is for the person in the situation to decide when and what that gift is, what feels like a gift. We've done that episode and we're recording this just a couple of days before Thanksgiving. So there's a lot of that gratitude in the air. And what this niyama asks us to do in some way is to practice gratitude. I'm going to quote here from the Yoga Journal article. The process of Santosha is relaxing into where you are. Oh, this is if you're on the mat, in your pose and realizing that it's perfect. Now, we've used the word perfect a few times in saying that these things are not meant to be perfect. And then it goes back to my first teacher, Lippy. There's no such thing as perfect and you already are. And I think that that statement is Santosha. That even in our imperfection, we are already perfect. And if we can recognize that, then whatever the, the turbulence is outside of us, they will land in different ways as we, as we do that work. Yeah, perfect is a really interesting word for me because 
for a while, I thought perfect was everything is exactly the way I want it to be. Therefore, it's perfect because that's how I want it. And I think that perfect, I don't know what's perfect until I get to look at it in the rear view mirror, because sometimes perfect is uncomfortable because in the end, it's going to turn into exactly what has to happen. And I think it was Thich Nhat Hanh that said something, sometimes not getting what you want is a beautiful stroke of luck that, you know, oh, if I got that thing I wanted, everything would be perfect. But finding out that not getting it and what ensued next was actually the perfect way to go. So yeah, that is, that's a word that has so many different ways to think about it. Back to words. What if we decided that everything was already perfect? Yeah. What if that was just the natural state of being was because it can't be anything other than it is. And so if we're not attached to it, then, you know, that is you know, perfection. I'm not a perfectionist. Like I don't, except for sometimes when I'm writing something, if I have the, the period outside the quote by accident, oh shit, I got to go back there and fix that. You know, unless I'm writing in England, I can put the, the punctuation outside the quotes. But if I'm, you know, putting something out there for someone else's consumption and I see that I've made an error, I might be quick to go fix that. But I've never fallen into that, that need to show up as some ideal for someone like the Instagram in the beginning when everything was just like these perfect pictures. And now we're getting into this new sort of phase of, you know, not everything has to be perfect and we can show our vulnerabilities and all of this. But what if our vulnerabilities and our need to be ideal and all of the, the mess was just perfect? That this, you know, this primordial ooze that we all kind of came from is perfect. Then we get to, you know, change our, our orientation around the word like we do with stress. It's not all bad. Perfect. You know, if you were raised to have to look a certain way or behave a certain way or be a certain, you know, sticky in a box of some sort, then I can understand that maybe those boundaries are things that need to be worked with. And can we really the armchair psychiatrist? <laughs> I just want to do come to the place of the basic definition centered and at peace in the midst of chaos. It, is it possible to have chaos going on around you and have a practice that's strong enough that even in this chaotic existence that we can touch those places of centered and at peace. Well, my and, oldest daughter, I'm not going to go into the details, but she was just through a traumatic event and was in the midst of chaos. I won't say she has these practices. She's young and, and has not been doing the actual practices, but her ability to maintain composure and to be a voice of reason and touchstone in the midst of a very chaotic experience She's been my teacher for years. And I looked at that and I was like, oh my God, that is, oh my little G God. <laughs> that is that is the aspiration for me to be able to be that centered in the middle of something like that. And I think I am in many ways, but her, her example was profound. Mm. Yes. And sometimes some somewhere, maybe that story will come out. But right now, just it's the not ability to tell. Right. Yeah. Just that's, yes. Just even the ability for someone to innately, for whatever she has done in her life, to be able to develop that skill, separate of the practices. And I think that's a really important, a really important part because we talk a lot about the practices that help us to get here. And we offer a practice, we offer our insights, but at the same time, you're saying she's young and she's not in the practice, but yet this is one of, I don't know, a, a core skill that she had in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, oh. yeah. And we're all born at different, you know, parts of our karmic experiences. If that's part of your belief system, you know, I, I think she came into this world, you know, with a certain amount of wisdom. <laughs> that she gets to cultivate and remember and, you know, and be shaken up too, you know, yeah. that's a thing. Ay, 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 ay. So we ay, get ay. to move on to, oh, wait, do you have a practice for this one from? Uh... I do indeed. For, it's not mine. It's Deborah. She's looking, yes. uh, just a few little quips she has. Looking outward for fulfillment will always disappoint us and keep contentment one step out of reach. She says, seeking and avoiding are expensive uses of energy. 
When we give the power of our emotional state to someone or something outside of ourselves, we have made ourselves helpless. Like these are just little things that this book is so good, but, and then she gets into gratitude and that whole thing. All right, let's get to the practice. The practice is week one. Notice when you find yourself getting ready for the next thing or looking for contentment from something outside of yourself. Journal your observations. I'm going to read one more. Notice how much energy you expend moving toward what you enjoy and avoiding what you dislike. Notice any physical gripping sensations in your body and journal what you notice. So those two can go together even. I think those are important. All right. Number three. Tapas, the fire of spiritual discipline. <laughs> right. So now we've gone through a couple of things. And I always think of this as, you know, fire. It's always burning away things. It's burning something. I think in, in Tapas, it's burning away impurities. I'll just read something from Joseph LePage. Consciously embrace the heat. Channel it to hasten the process of transformation. Through the process, the heat of Tapas is gradually transformed into the light of awakening that guides our spiritual journey. So how do we shed and burn away those things that are stopping us, these things that are obstacles and use them or use that energy, that heat as a way to move forward to the next stage. Power, our passion. I always think of fire and discipline. And when they, when I see those words together, I always think that they feel to me like having passion for something. My mom, again, she would say, you need a fire at your butt. <laughs> yeah. And that tapas literally means heat. And this is the one that brought up Manipura for me, the, the Manipura chakra, because that is the element of fire. And that is where we begin to transmute ourselves from the energy of our, our birth, you know, the tribes we were born into and the energy and belief systems of the families and cultures and societies we're born into. And we begin to burn away those things that don't align with our own true selves. You know, this is something that, you know, fire can warm, it can destroy. and so. In its destruction, it's creating space for, for renewal, for creation, for that, that authentic expression. And that fire in the chakra system is just below the heart chakra, which is air, which feeds. So when you talk about passion, the heart feeds the fire, it feeds the flame, the oxygen of the heart feeds the flame of desire and passion and creating that passionate experience. And so again, we cannot lift, airlift any one of these subtle things out of their systems and have it on its own. They're all interrelated. Like even when you said it burns away for purity, well, we just left, you know, Saucha was that first one that moved into, you know, contentment, which now we're on the other side of contentment and we get to experience this self-discipline, which, you know, a daily, daily practice, the daily discipline is the satna. I you know I've used that word quite a bit. It says in yoga, having a daily disciplined practice is referred to as a sadhana and is much like doing a small controlled burn on ourselves. It is the discipline of putting ourselves in places where the old debris has collected in us and can be removed. So that's from the book, Deborah Adil. I love this also. This is the asterisk. She put an asterisk next to sadhana. So the definition below, she says sadhana means spiritual discipline. It implies a dual aspect that the discipline itself is the fulfillment like a drop of water eventually shapes a rock. The consistency of practice over a period of time brings the change and fulfillment. Sadhana is the consistency of our daily practice. So that I love that image of the drop of water over time shaping a rock, changing it, molding it, but that it doesn't happen in an instant. It is the, the continuous consistency commitment I don't know. I, many years ago, I, I did a third eye drop. I forget what it was called. It was at the Ayurveda Spa in New York City. This was in the 1990s. And it was a constant drip of essential oil on the third eye. I thought I was going to go bananas when I first thought, heard about it. I was like, oh, shit, it's one of those water torture things that it's just going to constantly be dripping on me and I'm going to go insane. Oh, my lower case G God. Oh, my God. It was unbelievable. But it was the constant drip of this aromatherapy oil that was just coming down. By the time I left, I did feel transformed. 
I didn't journal it. I can't tell you the aha takeaways from that experience, except to say that in a generalized way, it was something like this. You talked about sadhana and some of the things that I was reading in reference to tapas were it had a wisdom component to it. So as we're coming through these practices, we are gaining more information, gaining more knowledge. And the wisdom going back to sadhana was to practice, especially when I don't feel like it, to get up and do it anyway, that this consistency in maintaining that slow burn, the agni that's in Man Manipura, agni, the fire of digestion. And our body naturally creates fires of digestion and warmth that we have different practices to enhance. But the digestion happens with everything that's taken into our body. Food is digested, water is digested, blood is digested, oxygen is digested. And then I always like to expand that. I was always curious when I learned yin, yoga, why the heart and lungs were paired with the large and small intestines. I found it really interesting that we had organs of digestion of heat and fire with the heart and the lungs until I realized that they are also organs of digestion, not food, but the other things that we are taking in and distributing through our body that we need to have pure, you know, burn away the impurities in what we take in so that the body can use it the most efficiently. And you know, go yeah. ahead, because no, I lost the second train no, of that. No, 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 but you, I've heard you say that before, the digestion piece and putting those things together. But what's new for me in this telling is the elemental pieces that one was air and one was fire. And so, you know, if we, again, look at the chakra system, look at the meridians, look at these pairings, there's wisdom to them that they, they are paired because the fire can't exist without oxygen, you know, on another level. Yes, the digestion piece and yes, all of those things that have to filter through and elementally, our dear Watsons, that they, they are partners in this, you know? So there's a beautiful poetry to the elements as they come into these pairings. I think I remember what I was going to say too. So yeah, the elements really do show up. I love that. So do the, the senses and the emotions, I think also the more subtle parts of who we are. And when I thought about the heart as a digestive organ, I also like to think in terms of listening to the brain speak, but also to listen to the voice of the heart. And I personally, over m most of my life, was much better at listening to my brain speak than I was to listen and trust that the heart's voice was also very, very wise and worth let giving it its opportunity to express its, its voice and its ideas. So the heart and the brain working in consort with each other. But what I realized in the way that I interpreted that digestion is I feel like the heart digests our emotions and our experiences. And that also brought it into an organ of fiery digestion. Because sometimes our emotions need a little fire to either boost them up because we want a little bit more of that or burn and transform them into I've accepted whatever this is. And now I'm going to digest that experience and let it transform through fire into a memory or whatever comes after it, but not sticking it into my body somewhere and just letting it sit over there and fester because I don't want it to go through that channel of digestion. And that sort of in its own way goes into tapas in this right effort. That's another way to kind of talk about it, this right yeah. effort. From the Yoga Journal article, tapas is translated as self-discipline. We've talked about that effort or internal fire. These are all things we've touched on. And the Yoga Sutra suggests that when tapas is in action, the heat it generates will both burn away impurities and kindle the sparks of divinity within. And I thought that was really interesting because when we think of transmutation and burning away, we think about the things that are being burned away that are leaving us. But what once it's like we're putting our attention on one thing, it's not on something else. If we're getting rid of something else, we're creating space for something else to come in. What are we creating that space for? 
for this connection to the divinity within. So again, however that shows up for you, could be your dog, could be dog energy. We're all good with that. She says, tapas is the willingness to do the work, which means developing discipline, enthusiasm, there's the passion, and a burning desire to learn, says Bell. You can apply tapas to anything you want to see happen in your life, playing an instrument, changing your diet, cultivating an attitude of loving kindness, contentment, or non-judgment. In yoga, it's often seen as a commitment to the practice. So Cope, who is also a writer on yoga a lot, he says, holding a posture is tapas. He says, you are restraining yourself from moving and you're watching what happens. In this way, you build the capacity to tolerate being with strong sensation. We talked about big feelings, strong sensation, and you get to answer the question, what is my real limit? And you get to develop the skill of witnessing, which is one of the most important skills of classical yoga. And this, when I read this, I laughed so hard because I thought about my meditation practice, not my yoga practice. I thought about every time I have an itch and I'm sitting still. And my teacher, Amy, who said that one of the questions was, Are, can I scratch the itch? And please, it's the itch is the sensation. What you, the action is the scratching. So you're not itching an itch, you're scratching an itch. That's my little PSA grammar wise. So this idea that the itch comes up, should I scratch it? And she says, no, you know, watch it. Because then that's one of the greatest, at least for me, has been a really profound teacher of impermanence and what I'm able to sit with knowing that at some point it will leave. And sometimes it's longer than others. And sometimes I succumb and I'm like, fuck this. And I just, I'll scratch. But that's where my limit was on that day. On another day, I can sit there. If it feels like I have something crawling on me, I'm more likely to succumb to scratching. If it just feels like an itch that has arisen out of a space, I can sit there and watch it as it passes. And when it does, I am freaking amazed every time it passes. So just something there, <laughs> like watching an itch. And being in touch with your your senses and what you feel. We did a little bit of this at the last day of the retreat, the watching of sensations and, you know, being able to connect with them. It was really cold and windy. And I'm so proud of everybody for dressing in layers and, you know, for spending the day outside when, you know, we had the same thing happen in camp. We had a super hot day. Here at the retreat, we had a cold and windy day. And we did a really great job of finding ways to sit, to do our practices in the sun, to let that fire come in to the practice and kind of balance out that cold wind that was blowing. But we also offered to not label the cold and the wind as good or bad, but to use it as a practice to just notice, what does it feel like to be cold? You know, what does that sensation feel like? And can you notice it without, like me, I'm not, cold isn't my favorite temperature. <laughs> I like being warm. So for me, that was, that's a big practice to step back and look at it and go, oh, this is what cold feels like rather than my mantra of, I hate the cold, I hate the cold, which makes me get really tight and, you know, closed off and tense, which just makes it a whole lot worse. So to be able to see it without labeling it, and then maybe turning your face up to the sun and notice the difference when the warmth. Um, Sounds is like Santosha to me. Sounds like it. Yes. Contentment. Santosha. Well, you met, you met a challenging, chaotic moment, something in part of your experience. You do not. How do we hold the space to not judge something as good or bad and still be true to how we feel in the moment? You're still allowed to not like the cold, but to be able to meet it as it is in that way is Santosha. It is the contentment of the moment, even if there's other stuff going on. You're, you're centered with your face to the sun saying, in, right now, the cold is not bad. It is what it is. And I'm mm -hmm. cold. <laughs> I'm cold. Yeah. So, oh, yes, fire of discipline and Santosha. So, yeah, like, as you said earlier, none of them are separate. They all intertwine and are interweaved. So, yeah. Do you yep. want to move on to a practice? Yes. Feels yes. Yes, absolutely. I got it right here. Good timing. Right. So here's, here's a practice. Remember the cathartic times in your life and how you were shaped by them. Notice the times you may have checked out from the pain and others where you were fearless in the fire and held on for the blessing. 
So that's where, you know, if we're lucky and time does, not lucky, but if we allow time to do its magic, the alchemy happens and the hard thing becomes a gem in our story. It becomes, you know, a landmark of, of goodness. Anyway, there's one more. Okay, so choose a practice of nourishing eating, meditating, contemplating, or something else that impacts the quality of your essence. Can you put yourself in the heat with enthusiasm? With that passion. Whoa. All right. We've got two more to go, people. Stick with us. Uh, this one is hard to say. Is it? Svadhyaya. Svadhyaya. I got it. Svadhyaya. Yeah. Svadhyaya. Svadhyaya. You can say it with the Yiddish too. It's a little Svadhyaya. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. The um, practice of self-study. Okay. So it's been pointed out to me that I go a lot when I... <laughs> <laughs> and that's what the practice of self-study makes me want to do. Like, whew, that is a big one. Turning it, uh, my attention inward to reflect on my own thoughts, emotions, reactions, beliefs, habits. Uh, until I really believe that until I understand how I am showing up in different situations that I can really reflect on myself. And it is a constant practice of big wins and big losses where I completely miss how I showed up. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I see that. You know, sometimes it's amazing. I show up as a really great version of Teresa. Sometimes I show up and I don't recognize that I did not really show up with compassion and love into certain situations. But through having moments of contemplation, it if I can find a way to notice when I'm not showing up, that my self-study practice catches me in it, then how does just showing up as your best self change all the interactions? And does that practice kind of move on to whoever you're in, in community with? So I'm the product of a psychiatric, uh, a forensic psychiatrist and a psychiatric social worker. So we did a lot of self-study growing up. It was a lot of asking questions about how we're feeling, what's going on, how are you processing? You know, we did a lot of the talking. So this one for me became really about shadow work. It, I recognized that so much of my own idea of who I thought I was or who I think I am came from external sources. It came from people validating me in ways that didn't always feel in alignment with how I felt about myself. And I'm sometimes surprised by the way people respond to me in person, not because I think I'm a bad person or that I think that I'm overly flawed or, too, you know, I'm not constantly berating myself, but I get a lot of positive uh, feedback and I, I appreciate it and I love it. And I love, I love the communities I'm in. It also makes me wonder, like, why don't I always feel the way other people are kind of implying I make them feel? And so this idea of reflection became a really important part of my practices, not just the dark ones, not just when I am experiencing or I'm in community with someone or I see a new story that really triggers me in a negative way that I feel frustrated or, or angry or any of the really low vibrating but intense feelings. I have to say, where does that live in me? So I may not be a classical narcissist, but where does narcissism live in me as maybe an un- an unhatched um, egg or, you know, a seed that hasn't quite broken the surface. Where is the origin story of this? Because I can't experience it, number one, see it if I don't have it myself somewhere. And I can't, op I can't definitely be triggered that much by something unless it's something within me that I need to, to figure out. So when I learned about shadow work, which is really psychotherapy in some ways, as my dad would tell me, that that became a real opportunity to break myself open, to see myself as I am, maybe not through other people's eyes, but to be able to work on those things. But what balances that out is the golden shadow. So golden shadow, one of my teachers, Amy, which you would talk about the people who they don't trigger you in a negative way, but you are fully in awe of them, that you feel that they are just, there's everything about them lights you up and turns you on. You get to own those things too. You get to look in and see, I get to look in and see where do I own unconditional love and inspiration and all the things that I see in people that, that really turn me the fuck on. 
And so these two things have been vehicles that have allowed me to do this thing called Svadhyaya, this self-study. And I've been able to sort of take that onto the mat, onto the cushion, and then back off of the mat and off of the cushion. And these have been some of the more enlightening avenues of the last several years, I have to say. I love that comparison of the shadow work and then the golden shadows, because it reminded me that sometimes in the practice of self-study, I can get all caught up in the things I don't do well. Yeah. And when we balance out those shadows with the golden shadows and, and all of those good qualities, it's the reminder that if I'm going to spend time looking at the times I don't show up well, that they need to be balanced with the celebrations of the times where I show up as an awesome person and whatever it is that my best self came forward. I think for me, I feel like it, there's sometimes more attention put on the things that aren't done well than there are on really highlighting and lifting up all of the gifts and the qualities and taking the time to celebrate those wins, to celebrate the parts of us that are our best qualities. So in self-study, we look at both sides. And, you know, looking back on all of the photos. I love taking photos. It's just one of my favorite things to do is to be out with my camera by myself or with others, but a lot on my own as kind of a meditative being out in nature practice. But if you took the time to look at a couple of them, there are so many times that when I'm looking and reflecting back that what I take are photos of reflections. I love when the sun is low in the sky, either at sunrise and sunset, and the reflections in water, in you know puddles on the ground, just opposites how buildings, outlines, and shadows show up in, even in the city. It doesn't have to be in nature. There's just so many ways that I look back and see reflection as something that I was doing all the time, but without really putting it into the context of how does this expression of something I love fit in with this practice of self-study and looking at self, both in my most awesome qualities and the ones that are hidden in that reflective shadow. Yeah, this is, this is what it's all about, right? I want to read a little bit from this Yoga Journal article, too, because I think that it, it helps to kind of, from the anecdotes that we have about self-study to um, a structured uh, thing. And I, they, I'll, again, I'll put it in the show notes. She says, happiness is our nature, and it's not wrong to desire it. What is wrong is seeking it outside when it is inside. So we're talking about a lot of feminine energy here. We're talking about that going in. And, you know, we also talked about the cold and hibernation is going in. It's going in for self-study. To tap into the wellspring of happiness that lies within each of us, just try dedicating yourself to Svadhyaya, the art of self-study, of looking within and asking the eternal question, who am I? The Yoga Sutra suggests that the study of the self, capital S, leads you toward communion with the divine, capital D. I'm not going to read all of that. Da, da, da. So this cope is writing this. For most of us, the most, fruitful, the most fruitful practice will be looking at the self. Are you on time and orderly? So this goes back to purity and the other, like, are you operating from the other yamas and the yamas? Are you sloppy and late? What makes you mad or happy? Now, he's not judging these things. He's just asking about the different conditions. I think it's Stephen Cope. But again, it'll all be in the show notes. How do you feel about that person on the next mat who is invading your space? Develop the capacity to find the answers without chastising or lauding yourself in the process. So again, no judgment, just who are you? Meet yourself where you are. Swami Kripalu, the founder of Kripalu Yoga, said the highest spiritual practice is self-observation without judgment. Svadhyaya, we're quoting here, is a skillful and systematic investigation of how things are, says Cope. When you practice self-observation, you begin to uncover and address the unconscious patterns governing your life. When you can notice but not judge what you are doing and how you are feeling in every moment, you open a window to empathy for yourself and gain the stability you need to extend it to others. So this is how we 
we synthesize, how we digest it through our practices. So again, the, the whole metaphor of digestion works so beautifully in the flow of these, these experiences, because now we're, we're digesting our own sense of self. Digestion doesn't judge what food you put into your body. You know, it's going to break it down the best it can, no matter what. It's going to treat it all the way that it knows how to do it. And so if we can get into that observational, like you even said, these are personal ob observations. But if we take the word observe out of that and bring it to the witness, this is that objective place through which we want to ultimately be able to work with our sense of self. Yes, if you're only looking at the self, it is easy to lose perspective. You know, it also, the self-study, we've talked about it in so many different ways. But while you were speaking about digestion in different ways and the body not judging the food that we put in, it reminded me of Anamaya Kosha. And again, something we've talked about earlier in other episodes, the practice of interoceptive awareness, the looking at the internal organs and to understand why with this practice of self-study, for instance, I like to have coffee in the morning, but if I don't put cinnamon in my coffee to get rid of and cut down some of the bitterness, my bladder will be irritable. That's something that come, came from this self-study of noticing, like, why do I feel irritable inside in the mornings? And I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to have to give up coffee. And somebody said, hey, try cinnamon. Whoa, oh, what a game changer that was. But the practice of being able to see how our body is functioning and feeling and taking the time to notice when I put this in my body, I feel like this in the morning. Maybe uh, it's a party and we're in this self-study. I went to the party. I kind of forgot some of my disciplines. I drank one too many glasses of wine. I wake up with a headache. That's a study, a self-study that kind of puts everything together so that when we're digesting our emotions, we don't leave out any of the layers of the koshas. We take the time to look at our thoughts and our emotions, but also the physical body as well. So okay. let's, let's do the practice for this one. And then we'll move on to the final one, Ishvara Pranidana. So Svadhyaya, here we go. 99% of what bothers you is about you. 99% of what bothers others has nothing to do with you. This week, notice how you turn the above statement around, blaming others for your own problems and taking responsibility for others' problems. Practice taking responsibility for yourself and letting others be responsible for themselves. This week, grow the power of your witness by watching all your actions and thoughts as if you were watching a movie. Begin to experience yourself as supreme strength the fullness of wisdom and unquenchable joy. For this month, ponder the words of Houston Smith and unwrap yourself. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> drop those veils. <laughs> oh, yeah. So now Ishvara Pranidana. Okay, we yeah. get to come back. Yes, full circle. So my interpretation of what I read was the Lord of Creation and surrender. So here we go with terms with capitals and lowers again, right? Who is the creator? And, you know, embrace creation in whatever an individual's creation story is. There's so many creation stories. But when we're committed to our creation story, can we approach it with reverence and honor and appreciation that we have been created, you know? My mom and dad were a creator of me and I love and honor and, and appreciate them. But this is so much bigger. This is what is the creator or how do we view everything around us and how it came to be? So Deborah Deal in her first little blurb, she says, Ishvara Pranidana, the jewel of surrender, presupposes that there is a divine force at work in our lives. Ultimately, this guideline invites us to surrender our egos open our hearts, and accept the higher purpose of our being. She, she tells a story in the beginning. I'm not going to read it, but I'll retell it, and it's her story. But she recounts the movie Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I don't know if you've ever seen Michael Caine and Steve yes. Martin. Uh -huh. um, I forget the woman's name. She was great, too. But these two guys, they're con men, and they're engaged in contests who can find a vulnerable woman and 
you know, uh, relieve her of $50,000. <laughs> Whoever wins the contest gets to work that area because it's a very lucrative area for con people, apparently. So they find this woman and they do their work and work and work. And by the end, finds out she's been conning them the whole time and she gets his $50,000 and leaves. Steve Martin's character throws a fucking tantrum and he's like, fuck, 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 yeah, I can't believe it. And he's all like, it got his panties in a, in a twist. Michael Caine, however, takes a deep breath and he just smiles. He smiles with that surrender of knowing that someone outwitted him and he's in awe of her amazingness. So he has let go of his ego. He's let go of his whole agenda getting there. Just within that smile is Ishvara Pranidhana. Like it's right there. And I thought, what? because I'm someone, I love pop culture. I, I watch a lot of TV. I, re, I watch a lot of movies. I read a lot of books. I, I love that. So I'm always making those kind of references. And I've seen that movie a dozen times many years ago, but I would never have thought of that. That was, that was a leap further than my mind could take me. And, but when I read it, it landed so centrally and I was like, yes. So I just love when people can sort of create a picture or draw, tell a story and create that metaphor in a way that is so highly relatable, but would never have occurred to me to begin with. Yeah, that wouldn't have occurred to me, but I love the story. Um, just being able to sit back in pure appreciation for somebody's skill, even though they outwitted you. So yeah, surrender means giving up control. And for me, that is really hard. I like being in control. And it is a practice to be able to really notice when I'm trying to control situations and to be able to surrender, to know that control is an illusion. I might think I've got everything all worked out and it's going to work out exactly this way because I figured out every single detail. But in the end, there's always that surprise, the thing I could never think of that can, and if it comes early early enough in a situation, it throws the whole thing out of whack and you have to really just be like, huh, isn't that interesting? Thank you for stopping by and letting me know, like, as soon as I arrived, I had no control over the situation. But I think it's, it's a hard, I find it to be a really hard practice to surrender, to surrender control. Well, notice how this is not the first one of the limbs. Yeah. The final, it's the, well, not limb, the final niyama. It's not the first yama or the first niyama. It's the last one. It's the final one. So that suggests to me that it is more challenging to inhabit the space of surrender. And so maybe all of the practices, because even what you were saying about noticing, that's svadhyaya, noticing when you need to be in control. So once again, the flow of these practices and observations and restraints is there, there, there's wisdom there. There's a wisdom to know that you have to sort of work on cleaning your space before you can move into, into contentment, you know, and you need to sort of find a sense of contentment before you can, you know, so there's this sense of, uh, you know, progression. And so, yes, it is hard. I, I, I guess, you know, part of Svadhyaya had me realize that I am more controlling than I thought I was in the same way that in Ayurveda, I never got any pitta, any fire in any of my tests because the questions are so like, I'm answering them through the filter of my own f- thinking of who I think I am. And so as if I think I'm some chill, relaxed, you know, hippie chick sitting on the couch enjoying some bonbons, you know, doing whatever, then I'm not going to answer anything that is going to be fiery and exciting. But that was, I was not engaged fully in Svadhyaya at the time. If I had been, I would have known what my Ayurvedic teacher told me, which was, honey, I knew you were pitched at the moment you walked in the door. And so she knew something about me, again, reflecting back so that I could do the deeper study. And then I realized, yeah, I have a lot of pitta in me, but in the same way that I never thought of myself as controlling because I was always the person who was like, I'm not really the leader. I'll, I'll, I take good direction. Every theater director I ever had said, you take great direction. I'll do whatever you tell me. Like, not whatever you tell me, but whatever. But when I realized through self-study that there are more moments than not that I feel the need to direct or control a situation, that was really eye-opening. And I don't think we can inhabit the space of surrender as long as we're still trying to hold on. So as Spadhyaya and all the ones before, there are senses of non-attachment. This is where that really comes into play. Can we release our ego in service of someone else's greatness? 
you know, and realize it doesn't dim our light in any way. Is surrender a practice or is it the result of practice? Is it a chicken egg situation? I guess we can practice surrender, but how would we do that practically? And I think that comes from the the predecessors. Mm. I don't really know. What do you think? I don't really know either. I hear the word a lot. You just have to surrender and trust. And honestly, I'm still working on it because when I think about what does it mean for me to surrender and to just be okay with what comes up, it's not necessarily, it's the how. How do I do such a thing? And what does that look like? In concept, I'm like, oh, surrender to whatever's going to happen. And, you know, it sounds fine. But in reality of what does it look like to surrender, I'm really working on creating what that looks like in uh, Teresa 6.4, because I'm at Teresa 6.3 now. So maybe next year, hey, we'll come up with that one. But Joseph Lepage says that part of this is acknowledging that the creator exists in everything, in our own body, minds, thoughts, in nature, in everything that we encounter, the creator exists there. And if we can recognize that in an effort to come to harmony and balance within ourselves, we can live in a place where we can bring harmony and balance to communities, families, the universe, whatever that is. It's a tall order. It is a tall order. And I think that this is a practice. This is a system of practices that allows us access to that space a little more readily than if it was not there. Unless, of course, you're born into it and you just have the natural core, you know, abilities. Uh, One of the things, though, I can say practically in this is that, you know, in a partnership like we have, we've run up against challenges. We've butted our heads against each other. And I will say from my end, it always comes back to ego for me. You know, it's my ego because I don't either... Uh, as the youngest of four, as someone who didn't always feel heard or seen, had to be a little bit louder, a little bit noisier, and a little bit you know, more in your face to kind of get my message out there. But one of the things that is allowing me to work in a space of surrender is practicing listening more. And that's something that came from our partnership, that there's a relational quality to this too. Even though it's about going inside ourselves, we don't live in a vacuum. And that so much of the reflection I have gotten back in my Svadhyaya has come from this partnership and has allowed me to become a better person. I'll say better, but, you know, is that a value judgment? I don't know. It allows me to work from a higher frequency, maybe a place where I can feel more in alignment internally with the, with the external feedback that I'm getting. Like it all comes back full circle to that. But I just, I want to thank you for that because the ego, now there are many different ways to talk about the ego too. In yoga, we always talk about it sounds bad, but we need to have a sense of self, like thinking. It's, we're not trying to get rid of our thoughts and meditation. We're not trying to, you know, outlive our humanness or, or relinquish our humanity. It's about maybe deepening our relationship to our own humanity, which it requires us to let go of the ego part that is maybe overshadowing or reflecting something back that is not so. Uh, you know, good ego, bad ego. Are we, what are we doing here? I don't mean to reduce it down to good or bad, but there, there are different ways of looking at the ego. There's Freudian, there's spiritual, there's, you know, sense of I, it's Latin for I. And, you mm-hmm. know, without, we can't live without, without, hey, who are you? I mean, we can get philosophical about it, but then I get lost in those ethers and I won't be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> So one of the, you mentioned, uh, you know, we've been in a growth process for a year going through all of these different teachings that both of us had to study and learn. We had all the foundation, but we continue to deepen that knowledge in order to be able to share it and bring it forward. So there was a lot of change and growth. I know that I went through uh, at the same time. I mean, Going back to season one and where I am now is worlds apart, worlds apart. And a lot of that, some of those things came from butting of those heads because it made me notice just how overly sensitive I can be at certain things and not really even noticing that it was just this oversensitivity to an action that now I have to look at, like we looked at patterns, thank goodness. Because the pattern 
it <laughs> became really highlighted when we were talking about patterns. And the same thing, I find it really interesting that when you talked about like butting heads and you being number four and sometimes being unseen and unheard, the first thing I thought about when you said we butted heads sometimes, I was like, yes, yeah, number five, I was often unseen and unheard. And I find it interesting that in those small instances, there haven't been a lot of them because most of the time we can sit back and go, okay, what are we talking about? And we brain dump in, in a lot of different directions. But I find it fascinating in this self-study that the butting of the head has the same root value for both of us, that feeling unseen and unheard is the thing that we're like, I need to get you to understand what I have to say. So thank you also for that reflection and that deepening of the knowledge that my ego is showing up as just being just like really oversensitive rather than being able to step back and say, I wonder where this is going and what we're talking about right now, which we did get much better at doing. We did. We did. Totally. We got so much better at just noticing when that is happening. And then pausing and going, okay, let's just stop and listen to each other. And the funniest thing about it is finding out that we're both right. going to the same place many times. Yeah. Yes. So yes, yes, yes. Anyway, just to growth. Get back to, to the <laughs> yeah. to the God thing, because the whole divinity within was it, I don't know if this is this hair again now from the same article says you don't have to believe in an anthropomorphic representation of God to accept that there is a divine design. A benevolent essence in the universe, says Harrigan. It's about offering oneself, and I love this. I fucking love this. It's about offering oneself to the divine matrix. Are you going to take the red pill or the blue pill? It's letting our own holy, he didn't say that. It's letting our own holy essence guide our actions and catching the sacred power of life. You can always pause to look for the higher essence in any situation. And I think that that, that again goes back to, is that the same as everything happens for a reason? You can find the good in everything. There's a lesson in everything. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go back to discernment and it's all about timing, divine timing. All timing is divine. And sometimes we have to be an asshole in that divine timing. Sometimes we have to, you know, but I thought that was really quite good. Ah, yeah. it is. I like that word and I learned how to say it. So now I like it even more. I think in the end... Closing thoughts that I have for the practice for all of these as they build on one another is to live in a place of harmony and balance with self and others. And boy, huh, could you imagine harmony and balance? Could you imagine? I mean, could you imagine? <laughs> Sorry, that's from Chicago. Little B.B. Newworth. Mm. Feeling her channeling in. <laughs> Surrendering to the B.B. ness of it all. Okay, so here's a practice from Miss Adil. This week, watch your attitude and responses to the moment. Are you fear fearful, trusting, fighting, judging, or annoyed? Notice if there's a pattern in your attitude. Yeah, cool. Hey. And there's one more I'll just throw out. This week, notice any tension that arises in your body when you need the moment to be your way. This is all about the embodiment, hey. too. I love the ones where feel it in your body. Consciously choose to relax your body and shift your attitude to curiosity. Notice what happens. Uh, notice right. what you notice. Right? Santosha and be, be cool with whatever it is that arises. Yes. All right. After three hours of Niyama-ing with you today. Thank you. Thank you for showing up and, and sticking with us, even if you had to pause and come back later. And let us know how your practice is going. We've talked about the yamas and the niyamas. How did it land? And what places did you connect with the most? Which of these practices do you feel like, oh, yeah, I really am in that. Even if you didn't originally come from yamas and the niyamas, but it touched on another body of knowledge that you have. So where are you? Send us your thoughts, anecdotalanatomy at gmail.com. And, you know, any of the practices that we've offered over these seasons, these many, many seasons coming up on a year, um, send us your takeaways. Send us, you know, what, what happened? Did you find any transformation? Were you inspired by something? Are you missing something? What do you want? You know, let us know. We are having so much fun and we're not done yet. We've got so many fun programs in the pipeline. <laughs> so excited to offer to you. So when we're ready for that, we'll let you know. Until next time, see you then. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for listening, for rating, reviewing, and subscribing to our channels and other stuff. Thank you for inspiring us to have these conversations and to create contemplative live experiences that move our bodies, hearts, and minds to the rhythm of our highest selves. Thank you for showing up. Feel free to send us your stories, questions, and comments to anecdotalanatomy at gmail.com. As always, we want to thank our amazing editor, Judith George, Keith Kenny for our fun music, and Cindy Fatsis for our photos. Journey with us as we continue down the roads of discovery, taking the detours and meeting the mysteries. You are our why. See you next time.